Let's get started. So here we are for our live conversation on the book Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts. And you all know this already. Uh, we got Paul Bogle and Pam Parsons Dupuy and myself, Marco Morelli. And we're going to talk about the last um, uh, pages, roughly 630 to 740 uh, of the book. And we've all done the reading. We're all caught up, uh, which is cool because um, yeah, because otherwise I was going to do the spoiler the spoilers anyway this week. Uh, last week we we got all kind of mushy and um, just appre just appreciated the conversation. Codependent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, today the 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 sword of compassionate wisdom was going to come down, and we were going to. And we had to. I, I, I felt like we couldn't m move on uh, in this conversation without talking about where this, where this novel goes. Uh, it has been a dark, uh, a dark, uh, you know, couple hundred pages really, going from the prison to um, really coming back to Bombay, the life, assuming the life of crime, and uh, and then Prabhakar dying, Abdullah dying. And um, now Lynn uh, going off to war uh, into the the uh, Soviet Af Afghanistan war uh, to fight along with uh, Qadir Khan, his father figure and his mafia don, uh, in this this cause that uh, that uh, Qadir Bai has, uh, that which involves bringing uh, uh, supplies, arms, and, and other materials to his clan, to, to fighters in his clan in the mountains of Af Afghanistan. And so these were, paid, these were chapters 30 to 34. And um, what we had been doing uh, for a couple of calls uh, before the last one is doing a review or a summary of each of the chapters and just making sure we understood what happened because so much happens from, from chapter to chapter and within each chapter. And it's, it, was, it was becoming useful to just lay it out on the table and like re refresh our memories, connect some dots. And then from that perspective, we began developing our reflections and sharing and then, and then, you know, going peeling away the layers of the onion into how, into the philosophical and the spiritual questions that the book raises. So, if if you guys would like to do that, I think um, uh, we can follow that same format again. Uh, and if you have any other ideas, uh, now is a good time to throw them out. That works for me. Sounds good. I'm sort of reeling. As you can imagine, because I just finished page 740 when this started. So I just found out all about Cotter Bai and um, his real role in Lin Baba's life, Lin's life. So anyway, I may, not, the, the I may not have a lot of thought <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, I mean, I found, I found my own reactions to be pretty raw and before I had done the last call, I had just recently, I just paid minutes before read about uh, Prabhakar's death. So I was still in a kind of state of shock, actually. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I think that the, 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 the kind of reaction like sort of changes over, over time. I mean, it's still just a book, you know, and we're still just, you know, reading about it. We're not, we're not living it. It's a virtual thing. Um, but uh, I remember how deeply I was affected by it, and David was as well. And like we were all weepy <laughs> the last time we talked. Um, I cried <laughs> when I got to that part where um, Kabaker died. You know, that was a few nights ago. I was up till three in the morning reading, and I finally shifted into my my more youthful thing where I couldn't put the book down, and you know, the hell with everything else of my life, and. <laughs> Yeah, that actually happened to me last night. I've, I've actually read past our, our assignment this week. Uh, and I, I was like reading with one eye closed, like just because I, you know, something in me like just wanted to stay awake and find out what happened next. And uh, I found out. Um, so, uh, Paul, you, you, you've been taking notes and stuff. Do, do you, would you like to uh, start us on chapter 30 and 
this is immediately what happens after Pabakar's death. These are the this is the very the very next page after um, Lin's farewell, his his address to Pabakar at the end of the previous chapter. It's good if I start with uh, thirty or do thirty one because I didn't do my normal full notes. I was just finishing my notes as we started, and I only got to about halfway through chapter thirty two. So I'm glad you asked me to do thirty instead of one later. Well, we could tag team them all too. Like right. it, it, even if it just comes out in fragments, as long as we get all the pieces. Yeah. Off. Well, the thirty starts with heroin. I think is the first word of the chapter. And uh, so there's a whole big, deep description about heroin, the heroin effect, and then heroin withdrawal. Um, But he sort of introduces heroin and what it does, but then he backtracks, Lynn backtracks a little bit. Um, And after um, Abdullah's death, um, it turns out that the mafia council has disappeared, basically. Cotter and the other cronies have pretty much gone, and he experiences this deep loneliness in this city. Um, and he starts to question Cotter by because of the whole um, concerns about Sapna and the blame uh, that had been placed on Abdullah that the police had chased him down. And then he ended up being, of course, dismembered, and they couldn't, you know, even bury him because they didn't have his parts of his body. <clears throat> and he, <clears throat> in the midst of this, um, Lynn has an opportunity with uh, Lisa, whom they had rescued from Madame Joe's, and um, she's getting involved as a casting agent, I think, with uh, the the Bollywood crowd there. And there's this clear opportunity for him to kind of, in a sense, participate and continue with his recruiting with her. Um, and they also, in their discussions, recollect the horror of the um, murder scene, the fight scene that had happened in Lisa and Ulla's apartment. And so we're kind of brought back into the haunting image of uh, Modena, the Spaniard, and how uh, Ulla had basically left him sliced up and gagged and uh, and ran off. And so um, they're just... Dis- they're bonding a little bit over their, their mutual trauma. Maybe I would add that, it seems to me. And his feelings, Lynn's feelings for uh, Lisa and uh, his descriptions of her, his vivid descriptions of her beauty come through, but he really comes back to the fact that he loves Carla. You know, he's div- he, his, his love is there for Carla. And um, uh, then we get into the deep, dark addiction and... Um, uh, and then uh, he's he's rescued basically by Nazir, who is um, I don't know what we'd call him in relationship to Kaderbai, but his um, bodyguard maybe and and, and right hand man, <clears throat> someone that uh, Lin had always thought he'd have to end up fighting at least early on, and um, so they do have their fight, and Lin is uh, so wasted he can't really hold up his own and. He's carried like a sack out of the um, heroin den. And um, he, we, we know first by the smell of the perfume that, that there is Carla waiting in this um, space. And then the process of him um, going through the withdrawals. Um, and I found it was interesting that he ends up riding a horse afterwards because I was thinking, oh, isn't horse a, another name for um, heroin, right? So he ends up becoming a, getting trained as a horseman um, with Nazir. And uh, that was a good bit of uh, comic relief because of his relationship with the horses. And uh, then we get to a consummation or uh, another um, connection, a lovemaking scene with Carla. And and I'll just go ahead and throw some of my piece in there. That was so painful as he's really pressing her out of his, you know, deep need to uh, say, I love you back to him. And then her reaction and then the sadness of that, um, it, that, that, uh, 
that really sort of uh, completed that particular scene to me with a, a, a sort of a twist of the knife in the heart. That's a good way of putting it. Was that the end of the chapter, that scene? Um, I think it is, right? And That was one chapter? All that happened in one <laughs> chapter? <laughs> wow. Uh, um, yeah. Mm. Oh, I don't even know what to say about it. I, I, I uh... We learn more about how about Carla and um, how she really came to know Lynn and what she was really up to uh, in the the last chapter that we read uh, through Lynn's last conversation with Katerbai. And I think that's like that's one of the that's one of the kind of the subplots of what's going on, right? Is uh, what is what is their relationship really? Uh, he loves her. He loved her. Yet he can he twice now makes choices to not be with her, uh, to leave her. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he first sees Carla, after um, after he gets out of the heroin house, Gupta G's opium den where he was for three months, he, uh, he, she says something, and the first question he asks her is not about her, but about him, about Kaderbai, right? Mm-hmm. And he reflects on the fact that he had asked the wrong question. He says, if he'd only asked the right question, he might have gotten the piece of knowledge that he needed to be saved or something, right? Uh, or, uh, but what we do, I, I guess we, we'll get to it when we get to that chapter. Um, I guess the question that I have, that knife, that twist of the knife is, uh, like, is there any pure love here between anybody? Uh, and uh, I, you know, to, how much deception is involved in uh, in the love that people express or choose not to express, and, and, and I guess we learn about that a bit in the mm-hmm. subsequent chapters, and particularly in the in the last one. Uh, I, I don't know if there's an answer to, <laughs> to those questions either. Um, well, what comes to mind is there was a very pure expression of love uh, with the horse. <laughs> Nazir says something. He says, all, all horse good, all man bad. Oh, no, no, not all men good. Something like that. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, but what essentially has happened is that Kaderbai has rescued Lin out of his heroin hole uh, because he is ready to proceed with his mission. Uh, the mission for, for which we learn he had recruited him, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, this kind of sense that Lynn has had in, in previous episodes of being, uh, in, being encircled, you know, being surrounded by this trap, like closing in on him, uh, coming to a moment of destiny. That, that's the, the other thing, the sense that he's expressed a couple of times. Um, and I guess then in the next chapter, uh, I guess what happens at the end of this chapter is that they're they're preparing to go off they're preparing to to pursue this this mission uh and uh and in chapter in chapter 31 they begin they they begin their their trek which is going to take months of going from bombay to kandahar the mountains outside of kandahar uh so um Pam, do you do you would do you want to like kind of like you know like throw out some things that you remember happened in this time? If I know it's probably fresh on your mind, so and you don't don't necessarily have notes, but um, what was your what was your uh, what was your experience of the uh, of the trip and then of the beginning of this war and of of uh, Lynn really kind of throwing everything away? Um, 
throwing what he had potentially in, in Bombay, either with Carlo or with, with Lisa uh, and that, you know, that sphere uh, and going off to war. Well, first of all, I was kind of excited to leave India and go to Pakistan and Afghanistan. They're countries I know almost nothing about, although I'm a Rooney fan. So, um, you know, I have this sort of interest, I guess, in Afghanistan a bit. And, and I don't know much about the history. I mean, I remember reading or hearing about the U.S. supporting the Mujahideen against the Russians, the, the cold, you know, the proxy war type thing. But I didn't really... Anyway, now I'm really interested and want to learn more about that part of history. Because there's mm. a, a part in there that talks about how the U.S. were were providing weapons and stuff for the Talibs. I'm assuming that means the Taliban. Yeah. Uh, I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, what a cluster, you know what. I mean, anyway, just the the, the mess of all of that. Um, I ended up. On the, I ended up on Wikipedia too, just to, to refresh my memory, because this was when I was a child. I, re, I remember uh, seeing images of the war on, on TV, like on the nightly news when I was in the 1980s. And, uh, you know, the, it was part of the Cold War, it was a proxy war. Uh, it was kind of like Russia's, at, Russia's Vietnam, or the Soviet Union's Vietnam. And it was one of the factors that, that ultimately brought it down, um, because they lost so so. Right. Uh, you know, it, it costs so many resources and lives. But if you go and read a little bit about the war, it was so devastating for Afghanistan. Uh, and um, I don't have the numbers right. I, I could pull it up on Wikipedia, but something like mil- three to four million people were displaced. Hundreds of thousands or, or potentially millions were, were killed. Uh, and um, as uh uh, the, uh, as Robert says in, in the book, uh, or Lynn, um, it took the, his, his view is it took the heart and soul out, out of the country. Mm-hmm. But then you go back and the whole history of Afghanistan is just war. Yeah, right, right. On right. A war and different uh, tr- tribes, uh, different uh, empires. Uh, it's it's kind of like a place where empires go, like the British Empire, the Soviet Union, and then <laughs> the United States right, right, to right, get right, like right. entangled up uh-huh. in a conflict that has no end mm-hmm. uh, and that costs way more. In fact, one thing, it co- the United States in its latest uh, war since, two, since 9-11 has spent more money militarily than the entire uh, economic, you know, domestic ec- economic product of, a, of the country itself <laughs> that we're fighting the war in. So just uh, our expenditure on on on, mili- on on military operations could uh, fund their entire country, <laughs> and so it's uh, like I was really yeah. um, just amazed at the turn that this guy's life had taken. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, really. how do you end up going from you know Western country, New Zealand, a developed developed world, to fighting with the mu- Mujahideen? Uh, against the Soviet Union, like in the mountains of Afghanistan. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, 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 uh, I just felt like it was grim. And uh, all like war movies I've seen, um, there's a, I forget the name, maybe it's Jarhead or another movie, but it takes you into like, like one of these compounds, like in the mountains where you know, the fighters are, just, are living there for months or years on end and just kind of holding this little piece of land on this, you know, mountain mm-hmm. that, you know, that enables them to uh, do the kinds of things that Qatarbai wanted to do, which is uh, repair weapons and, you know, arm, arm the other fighters. Uh, and it's just like the struggle for one little piece of land uh, that um, just takes you into this heart of darkness, really, mm. that... Uh, I, I found hard to find even the beauty in the language of the text. I found hard to enjoy <laughs> because because the whole atmosphere of it was so was so grim, and because Lynn has the foreboding that this is not going to end well. Uh, uh, and um, you know, we haven't met uh, we haven't met Habib yet <laughs> in in all this. Um, but 
I guess basically what happens in chapter 31 is that, uh, that we're in the city. I mean, it's sort of a transitional chapter. Uh, they're in, they go from Bombay to Keta and then Karachi. Uh, and we meet the blind singers again. And this is where we come full circle and learn about uh, how this plan has been in the works since Kadarbai and Lin first met. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's got this moment of anger, but mm-hmm. kind of he suppresses it or redirects it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and then we go, go into the mountains from there, at, not before hearing some of Kadar's story. You know, uh, have you ever read any of um, Idriya Shah? No. Just try reading the book, The Sufis. The Sufis? Yeah. It's kind of a classic. But he, I mean, you know, I remember when I was studying Sufism and we were reading um, Rumi, and we would do a, a zikr, kind of a prayer meditation chanting practice, and then we would open um, one of Rumi's main uh, books called the Mithnawi. And uh, I could only even understand it if we had done Zikr first, because it at least opened up my mind a bit to be able to receive the information. But, but one of the interesting things about the Sufis is they don't tell stories in a linear way. Um, and Idriya Shah particularly will, um, he'll tell you this, he'll tell you this, <laughs> he'll tell you this. If you're lucky, he might bring it together or come back around or he won't at all. Um, mm-hmm. And and I was thinking about Lynn, who's sort of a simple Western guy, and he finds himself in with Kadarbai, who is from this place where the thinking is very different and much more, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, like much more mandalic. strategic and... and um, you know, it's not a Western kind of mind that, you know, just sort of is more straightforward. It is, is, there's just, you know, he's able to hold all these secrets from Lynn and to create this masterful thing. And Lynn is just sort of the bumbling guy going through it and has no clue. And um, anyway, this I'm just speaking off the top of my head, but it, I, I mean, I relate more to Lynn because I'm more like Lynn. I'm kind of a linear concrete thinker. And the level of subtlety... Um, of um, at least my exposure to some of the the Sufi <laughs> styles of thinking, and in certainly a way that Qatarbai, um has orchestrated all of this. Anyway, hmm. um, I'm, I'm getting culture shock, I guess, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting a, I'm getting a, a mirroring of that sort of these cultural differences. And... What do you think, Paul? Well, I was um, thinking before we go on to 32, I wanted to mention the note in Lynn's pocket that had been delivered to him from Didier, Didier, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, he's been fed little pieces, Didier's been doing some detective work for him. uh, I guess it's right after the anger moment and and that, um, that sense of feeling the fate he opens up the note and it turns out that Didier has discovered that the person who set him up to go to Arthur road prison was indeed Madame Zhao, which, which I think was what was kind of obvious. I mean, yeah, it wasn't totally, that. yeah, it wasn't yeah. a total surprise. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I saw that coming too. Yeah. I wasn't surprised, but uh, it is interesting to learn later on that Madame Zhao and Cutterby have an arrangement mm-hmm. and that, uh, Kaderbai knew right away when Lin was put in prison. Right, right. And, but didn't get him out uh, because he needed Zhao's support with a Pakistani general. And so this was part of his, you know, strategic kind of thinking. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. he had to play one, off, one, one person off against the other. And I think that part of it, part of it, Pam, like reflecting on, on that sort of, the word that came to my mind was mandalic, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's quite right, but there's something yeah. sort of big and mm-hmm. um, patient even, right? Yeah. This is right. 50 years 
we learned about his story. Well, this is in a, uh, I think the next chapter. Yeah. In chapter 32, we learn about uh, Cotter's story. And um, I actually want to let you, you tell it, Paul, because I like your summaries. Um, yeah, you but, did a good job at that, Paul. But uh, it, it, one is the element of patience. Two is the element of strategy. Mm-hmm. Three is the element of a sort of moral calculus. Mm. Uh, four, I think, is an element of, um, of holding contradictions and paradoxes. And, and then I think the, the fifth thing, which might be the most important thing here, uh, is the element of cause, the element of, of mission or having a cause. And we come to this in, in a later chapter as well, in that final conversation between, between Lynn and Cotter, where Cotter uh, says, we have a cause, you know, this, this can change the world. Like he's mm-hmm. a fanatic in a certain way. Mm-hmm. From a certain perspective, he's a fanatic. Uh, Lynn's cause, which he re- retorts with, is that his cause is freedom. And right now I want to be free from you. It's kind of not as high-minded <laughs> as, as Cotter's. But uh, like all those elements in, in Cotter's like, character, I, he's what, to me, I think the most fascinating character in this, in this whole book uh, he's something more than the God, like a Godfather. He, you know, he's, he's a, he's a character like on, on the, on the level of uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's, uh, you know, film. Um, but he has this whole other dimension to him. That's so much vaster, I think so much more kind of infinite. You know, uh, I mean, he actually really does have a cause though, kind of a, a, a mission that guides what he's doing. Whereas Lynn is, he's still kind of a lost fellow. And that's why he got sucked into all of this because he doesn't have clarity about what he's doing and who he is and, and a mission. Um, mm. He has a, a capacity to love for sure. And to be noble at times, but, but he's kind of a lost guy. So he gets drafted into somebody else's war. That's really interesting. Uh, let's let's come back. Let's uh, uh, why don't we why don't we um, review what Cotter's story actually is and what like where that sense of mission comes from because uh, it's not purely sort of high like uh, idealistic. Uh, there is that part of it, but it's also coming out of a pretty ugly place as well, right? Well, I only got part way through the um, thirty-two, but um, part of Cotter's story, um, interestingly enough, ties him into um, his tutoring by a particular Scotsman and um, tracing these lineages, both the, we've, it fern, turns out the, um, the Scotsman scholars' um, ancestors were fighting Cotter's ancestors over um, Afghanistan and um, that I don't know. I I got this sense of this this blood feud and the revenge and the requirements and the deaths, the uh, sort of honor s- system um, behind all of that, um, as still being very much alive. And then we find out, you know, a bit later, um, Cotter buys motivation to you know, bring a sense of his own honor back by um, returning, returning with the prized horses. Um, but that sense of the, the, the blood feud um, as, a, <clears throat> as a history, and again, as is dark, and then we get the sense of how Cotterby ended up um, in Bombay and his lowly beginnings um, and being nearly um, rubbed out by a local mafia don, and yet because of the tutoring by this Scotsman and his impeccable English, he's recognized as an asset. And uh, there's just sort of deja vu, kind of. 
right deja vu and irony and mm-hmm. then you know because we can also see that lynn has been spotted as an asset to be his american mm-hmm. you know later on um and for me um the humanizing of Cotterby, for me um it didn't take away um i guess some of what you were saying there marco about his um I guess his spiritual status, he has kind of a, uh, a, a saintly quality to him or a, an, he's, he's um, like an elevated soul maybe or something. And when we were talking, if you don't mind my little aside, I have been introduced uh, years ago to a, a game that we know is um, Shoots and Ladders, but apparently it was taken from this board game played by yogis called Leela. And instead of shoots and ladders, you actually see serpents and arrows. And you play it the same way you roll the dice. And every place on this big board uh, is related to a state of consciousness that you can read about and go into. Huh. And um, at, the, at the sixth chakra level, you can get up there. And the big downfall describes being possessed of a holy vision and being willing to do what we would think of as horrific deeds because you're so possessed of the clarity and the, and the connection to the divine that human beings around you then can become more or less pawns Mm -hmm. in service. And I was thinking about that particular little point, you know, where you slide all the way back down to the first chakra (laughs) in the game of Leela. We can't hear you, Marco. You're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. I had a train going by. Um, uh, I, I'm, even, I'm not even going to go down what I was going to say, uh, but uh, one of the sort of illustrations of Cotterby's character and I think the, that kind of contradiction between um, the sixth chakra perhaps and first, second chakra uh, uh, aspects of his existence, dimensions of them. Uh, he talks about when he first killed a man, remember? And it was a, um, uh, it was actually a kind of noble moment. Mm-hmm. He, he was trying to stop uh, this man from beating his his child. Uh, he said it was a particularly br- brutal beating, and and he says, yes, when I f- was 15 years old, he's relating this to Lynn. I killed a man, comma. There's a comma for the first time. And then he laughs into silence and Lynn reflects on that phrase for the first time. And I mean, he then talks about killing again and again and again and again. And this blood feud is part of that same kind of lineage of the, or that same like cycle of mm-hmm. uh, offense and retribution. Uh, and yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I mean, in this, the, the, the idea of doing the wrong thing, excuse me, doing the, the wrong thing for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, when I first, when Cotter first introduced that, I didn't make the connection actually that he was really talking about himself. Uh, I, you know, he gave a couple of philosophical examples and we thought that he was talking about Lynn or I thought he was talking about Lynn, but uh, he was really talking about himself and, and there, I wonder if there's a way, and this is just occurring to me right now, that like this whole cosmology that he spins, like is is some way of like squaring that particular circle, you know, of of like of doing the wrong thing for the right reasons, for the right reasons being like this possession, like you put it, of a spiritual vision, you know, some kind of ultimate vision of writing reality, changing the world. Um restoring uh honor uh and you know it cotter is really almost like a classic tragic figure in this sense like he's a he has that tragic flaw like that it comes through in the end the pride that goes before the fall he he brings back horses Mm -hmm. uh to which he which he wants to deliver to his people uh that ends up requiring this detour which is the one that he takes when he's ultimately ambushed and killed uh, but what what would really hey you're giving a head you're sorry. giving a head sorry 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 <laughs> that's not at page 740 right. it hadn't happened yet all right all right so anyway we're on Cotter's story <laughs> right? 
<laughs> and the Blood Feud and Chota Gulpa, Bombay Rose. Now I'm looking at my. <laughs> All right. can we, let's can we talk about Habib then? He's we meet Habib in this chapter, and I would I would love to hear what you guys thought about Habib, or just I mean I don't know what there is to think about. Him. He's, he's, I, I was reminded of Gollum. Oh, oh nice! Yeah, I thought of Gollum from the Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Only you know um, we get the reason for Har- Habib's psychosis it's mm. just mm. so horrific and um i don't know it's going to bring tears to my eyes again that was one of those scenes of him returning to his village that had been gassed apparently the russians were experimenting and using some new weapons which certainly has been true as we've seen you know historically with it the, sounds like they're doing now in syria but. yeah and the united states did in vietnam with agent orange and so forth and um and the, him finding everybody, including the animals, dead, and then having to bury them and how long it took. And just that little bit of, you know, mm-hmm. it got really bad because it took so long to bury them. And, um, you know, he's come away from that. I guess he was a school teacher, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And um, and now he's he's gone he's gone crazy, and yet he's a savant and, and like a – uh, a, a ghost, I mean, the ultimate commando, being able to slip around everywhere and, and be a guide, but he's been um, rejected by all of these other Mujahideen, you know, encampments and, and, and guerrilla groups because he's just a little too much. He can't be trusted. He, he, uh, he has a stake that he made out of like the shovel that he used to bury his, all of his family members. And he tortures his, anybody who is sympathetic with the, the Soviets or the, any Soviets that he comes across with, with that, with that stake. Uh, I didn't quite, I couldn't quite picture his exact method. Uh, it was pretty gruesome uh, from the you know, details that I understood. Um, but the Gollum thing. Yeah. I'm actually reading the Hobbit right now to my daughter, to my uh, older daughter and we we were just actually reading the Gollum uh scene like literally like last night uh where the Bilbo you know meets the hobbit and some of the ways that Tolkien describes like the way that the Gollum moves and the way that his eyes are uh and like the way that he positions his body are totally reminiscent of of Habib in, in this chapter uh and I mean, I was sort of making a little bit light of him in my mind because he's such, he's like, so like out there, you know, he's so, he's so insane. He's so psychotic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really, you're right. I, I, it, it's unfair of me to do that because it really is coming from the, this, uh, this trauma, this, you know, over yeah. this devastating trauma, right. Yeah. That, that occurred. And that, um, you know, d- doesn't seem like uh, an uncommon experience amongst mm. many of these uh, characters. Uh, so um, Habib though is, leads them through the mountains because the, it, it's not, it would, it would only take them what a couple days or something to get to Kandahar. Uh, if they were to take the roads, they can't take the roads because of uh, the Soviets. Uh, so they have to go over the mountains. Uh, there are some scary moments uh, going over the mountains uh, on these like narrow ledges, like clinging against against the sheer cliffs, he almost falls into an abyss at one point. Uh, and um, and the horses uh, and, and the, the the horses freak out when a, a Russian fighter jet uh, flies over. Um, I mean, this is real, you know, real war. This is these are like real. I can't imagine more intense, more dangerous situations. Like, can't I can't imagine it. Um, so, I, if we're following the chapters now, we would be moving into chapter thirty-three. Can, can I make one little additional piece about? I think it's in thirty-two. The um, the connection with I think it's Khaled Ansari, the Palestinian, mm. and and Khaled volunteers right. to mind to be to be watchful over habib right. 
Mm-hmm. And Lynn puts it together at some point that that's Khaled's way of saving himself. And he himself came from the killing grounds in Lebanon where family members and clan members and so forth had been wiped out. I think in the it refugee was, camp, right? in the refugee camp, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, that we'd heard about before. And in an odd way, Lynn had befriended, Khaled, we found out that he liked him a lot and we know that he's very serious and grim and he's got a deep, I think he at some point says to Lynn that my hate is my hero. Am I remembering that correctly? Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that he volunteers and Lynn sees that, that connection, I found that really kind of poignant and meaningful. And I thought a lot about that after reading that chapter, how we're kind of drawn together to our mirror or that which we share Hmm. so we finally make it though to to the camp and and that um, wonderful entrance yeah (laughs) um i laughed out loud actually (laughs) (laughs) kayla was sleeping that trying to get to sleep Um, so we've gone to a town called Shaman over the mountains, uh, and, uh, they are attacked at one point, uh, by, um, there, there's some intrigue too, between the different tribes with one particular clan leader, uh, Ab- Abdul Mala, I think is his name is deciding who he's going to align with, whether right. you know, the Americans or the, or the, the Soviets, um, uh, you know, there, there's a price on Lynn's head. They definitely want him because uh, he's uh, he'd be a valuable asset for anybody who captured him. Um, and yeah, I mean, how, how do we want to go into this? This is like the this is the last chat, the last chapter. Um, yeah, and I, I should tell you, I've okay. got to leave at the hour, so I've got ten minutes. Okay, but. Uh, then you have to talk, Pam. You have to talk to us. <laughs> yeah, and you just you just you just read this, so we'll get the raw. The raw I was not. I was not expecting that um, level of intrigue, you know. Um, and actually, the thing I wanted to bring up was more sort of the way that he writes a bit. We haven't talked a lot about the way he writes, or maybe we have, and I don't remember. But but the way he keeps kind of. Is the word prefiguring? He kind of gives you clues about what's coming. Mm. Um, often. And um, I don't know what to make of that other than, than um, I mean, the device of that, I guess, other than to sort of raise expectations and to, to keep you going. Um, or to, and to... Uh, you know, sort of do that second guessing once he's through it all going, why didn't I see this? Why didn't I see that? I should have been paying attention. Hmm. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I'm still kind of raw around the revelation and how angry he was and felt conned by everything, but most especially about Carla. And like, I want to know, did, Caught her by sleep with Carla. Was that part of it? It didn't kind of say any of that, but that was sort of, I, I felt like uh, he was wondering that. And um, I was wondering that. Um, and, you know, m- maybe nothing comes of that, but uh, that's what I was busy thinking. He was really scared and worried about. Besides the fact that she had been, Cotter by his agent all along that the whole, you know, their whole history had been um, guided by Cotter, you know, basically. And he was played the fool. And, you know, how does he struggle with his genuine love for these people at the same time that they abuse that trust and that love? Mm. And, you know, but then I think back and, you know, several characters tell him, man, Carla was really impressed by your, your, the clinic, you know, I mean, that was something she could not stop talking about. 
Mm. You know, so that was sort of a, uh, there was something seemed to be pure for her in, in the way that she saw him acting in that role and it opened her to him, I think. Mm. So, so, you know, there is this, this, this mix of all the manipulation and then these moments where there was uh, real stuff that showed up too, maybe amongst all of them. So sort of, like you said, sort of all this deception, but where is there real care, and, you know, in the midst of all of that? It, it, it reminds me now, um, as I'm brought back into the way that I felt about the earlier scenes and then with the revelation then thinking about these earlier scenes, for instance, after the heroin addiction, was that another moment that Cotter sends in Carla? Is is he well enough? Is he okay? Even, you know, in her own intimate way, was she basically checking him out? Was there real affection? And I'm thinking of the ending of that movie, Pie. I didn't read the book, where we're left kind of as an audience. I don't know if you guys know the one with the guys in the, with the tiger and he tells us that. Yeah. yeah, and 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 um, seeing it with other people, it really felt like it was kind of our choice to decide. You know, how was how were we, did we wanting to take that story? What what is mm-hmm. what is what does our heart want it to be? Mm-hmm. And I can tell what my heart wants it to be. And yet, some part of me now feels like I'm caught in the in um, the doubt. Right. You know, the dubious nature and. Um, holding my wish for some of it to be some of Carla's love to be genuine. And yet the tainted, I think Lynn uses that word tainted quality. It leaves everything under question. Yeah. Very, very painful. Maybe I'll go get some heroin. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I love that description, by the way, the whole heroin part of it. Um, you know, I used to work in the treatment world and it was just interesting to get an inside description of the journey of that, you know. I, anyway, I found that very valuable. He put it quite poetically. I mean, he, yeah, he, rendered, yeah. he rendered the dark uh, with with some eloquence. Uh, without yeah, there was some really eloquent lines in that, right? And it, yeah, right. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, uh, um, well, I guess I'm just wondering, we have a few minutes before the top of the hour, if, how we want to uh, at least wrap up, like, you know, our time with you, uh, Pam. And uh, I think there's, you know, maybe Paul and I can hang out for another few minutes and, and kind of spin out a few more things. Uh, Abdullah is also uh, a part of this scheme. Uh, yeah. Example, we we yeah. learned that 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 scene in the the den of the the standing babas uh where abdul right. saves him he was actually there Carl. yeah <laughs> bodyguard he seemed to come out of nowhere um but that also explains why they why abdullah approached him when he was out walking like so like you were saying paul it, you know scenes that maybe in the past were a little bit off or like how did that work mm-hmm. um, actually have an explanation mm-hmm. in this, this scheme of things. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I guess I, I want to just maybe have a, maybe I'll just throw out a question. Um, well, I, I mean, an observation and a question. One is that when he get, when Lynn has his confrontation with uh, Cutter by, uh, he thinks to himself that he wishes. One of the things he's really angry about is is the fact that Kaderbai had sent had tested the medicines yeah. that, um, that they're bringing to Afghanistan on the uh, the slum dwellers mm-hmm. uh, who Lin was serving as a uh, a medic or doctor um, uh, back during the cholera epidemic and and other other things. He was really angry that that you know that about about that, but also he looked at that time as one of the sort of pure things that he did. Yeah, right. And that. And now that's tainted. And that's tainted too, right? Uh, and mm-hmm. almost that if if only he could have been simpler, 
like if, if only he could have just stayed doing that there seems to be this thought this um regret that if he could have continued just serving uh in that selfless way uh he might have avoided uh all of this um this tragedy that he stepped into uh and and then he also thinks about the prisoner uh anand was his name yeah right anand uh, and and at one point he he realizes now i'm going to like and and the thing with anand was that anand accepted his his punishment he even mm-hmm. welcomed it for doing what he did um the, the which he considered i guess you know the kind of wrong thing for the right reasons or virtuous act uh and lin realizes that he's going to now have to, uh, there's this moment this might be one of those prefiguring moments where he realizes that now there's no more hiding from his fate like he's going to get what he deserves and maybe there's maybe even in that decision to like the emboldening because he he's emboldened in a, to to confront Cotter right? like that is almost suicidal that is essentially a suicidal act because Cotter is his only pr- real protection uh in this environment and uh, and he that he also had prefigured this kind of this death wish, like when when he was in the city. It seemed to be also what the heroine could have been about. I mean, at one point he's just like fuck it, yeah. I'm gonna go get stoned, and 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 that's what he does. So I I kind of want to go back to Anand though, and and his jealousy that Anand accepts uh, the consequences of his actions because this whole story is about Lynn not accepting the consequences of his actions. And I mean, you know, maybe he really needed to escape or he would have died in the prison because of all the abuses and stuff. But, and, um, and, and we know that he eventually does go back. I mean, I know that part, although it's not showing up here yet. Yeah. But, but it does feel like that, that is kind of a, a crystal moment. Hmm about this whole sto- this whole story. Yeah. You know? And it's it's shrouded a bit in the past. Like we we haven't heard why he got divorced, how he first got into heroin, a little bit about how he did his armed robberies, but he hasn't yet come to to really a reckoning with that aspect of of his mm-hmm. of his life, not not in the text anyway. Um to 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 you know, to the point we're at. I know he keeps mentioning his daughter, and I'm like, okay, can I know more about the daughter? There's his daughter <laughs> hanging out. What, what's what's up with the daughter? Why, you know, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we haven't heard anything about his family, really. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is what yeah, I mean, this right. is what led to this whole life. I mean, he apparently was trying to be a writer. He um, uh, was educated. He, you know, studied philosophy. Uh he was a revolutionary. He had social, he had, you know, he had a cause actually, he had a cause. Right. Uh, yeah, and time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, well, well, I guess we're not done yet. <laughs> 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 so, um, to be continued. Yeah. I'll let you guys go. Awesome. All right. That was good. Thanks. Yeah. Good hanging out totally. with you, Pam. Yeah. It's great hanging out with you guys. All right. See ya. All right. Well, you went ahead a little bit also, did you, Marco? Did you as well? Well, I'm, I don't want to make necessarily for whatever's sake. I mean, we can spoil that next. And yes, I did. And I can say that that final scene, the revelation, left me feeling so overwhelmed and numb that I was really searching for my reaction to Cotter Bay's revelations, Lynn tracing all this back, seeing the, the the council members there and that they all knew that Cotter had left him in the prison. And so many reasons I felt to, um, you know, uh, d- kind of go along with Lynn and his outrage or his, his hatred. And, and uh, it, I have to say it, maybe it was written so well, but it was too much for me to process. Mm. Um, but very shortly into the next chapter, my heart got open and I found myself 
crying at the death. Mm. And, I, and I had not realized, oddly enough, how much that, you know, how um, um, the influence and the power and all that came about with, you know, Cotterby's mission, his, his sort of his, his sense of the cause and the righteousness behind it. And uh, um, his um, telling Lynn that he was treating him like a son, and in some way, I'm sure that was that was true. You know, deep in his in that, you know, his heart and mind and soul. Um, <clears throat> but it affected me to the point where I go, "Wow, how come I'm not responding? I'm yeah. I'm shaken up. I'm overwhelmed." Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I'm no I'm just noticing our. In, the, in our previous conversation uh, with Pam, that uh, part of me was also like, sort of distancing it, sort of not responding or being being maybe a little numb to it uh, through like just the, the appreciation for the humor of it or for uh, the um, the brilliance of it in some ways, in, in in the sense that it's like this intellectual masterpiece. That uh, and I don't mean the book. This it is in a masterpiece i think but i mean cotter by his own his own m- modus operandi his own way of being uh is um has this arc to it uh and uh this this uh he used a phrase lynn uses a phrase like the very i wish i could find it but that his very bearing for, for how complete, how realized his life is, is what, what gives him such a commanding presence. Uh, and it's, um, I guess one of the things about Kaderbai is that he's lived such a multidimensional life. Like he's lived as almost, you know, pure evil in some sense. A- and, um, at the same time as pure good and love in these, like, I, I feel like that's authentic about, about him. Uh, and I don't, I don't sense that he has, um, how to put this, but I don't sense that he's, con- that, he, that he's conflicted in a sort of narrow mind in, in this sort of self-absorbed way. Like when we get conflicted about things, we stew on them. I feel like his his whole demeanor, his whole way of holding the conflicts in his being is somehow, it's like, just like a bigger river, you know? It's like compared to a, the, a rushing stream, it, it just has a, it's more, there's more force overall. There's more that it contains. Uh, I don't want to elevate him on, uh, in, in that way, but um, what am I trying to get to? I mean, there's something about, that you're bringing up that's really interesting because I mean, I guess part of I mean, one, one question I, I have is, and we, it's not answered and may not be answerable. Like in, in this next chapter that we're beginning to spoil <laughs> or tease uh, <laughs> is what did Cotter really think of Lynn's rea- Lynn's anger? Like how did it really, how did it affect him? Did it cause him to question his devotion, his fanaticism, his his ideals, his cause, his his commitment, uh, or did he see it as part of just what must be accepted uh, uh, in, in the in his service to to the ultimate, in his service to the ultimate complexity, right? That that he saw as God. Uh, I don't know. Well, I'm curious if what you think about that, if, 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 if that resonates with you at all, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, 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 um, I'm also struggling a little bit to, to, I guess, understand. The, the Machiavellian quality, the sense of, you know, the complexity and the machinations and being able to see and know um, what's striking me as we're talking right now is, Cotterby is also deeply sensitive to human nature. It's as if he knows Lynn better than Lynn knows himself. That's kind of a sense 
that allows him to, in a way, craft and um, mold and have Lynn almost prove himself to himself and end up in this particular situation. It's, it's again, not to over elevate him, but, you know, Cotterby seems to, f- through his own experience to have a deep insight, you know, into um, not just the big picture, but, you know, what motivates people, what makes them tick, what they need, what love might do for or to them. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as uh, because he talked about the blood feud and the, and the, and the, and the history, you know, of the English invasion of Afghanistan. I kind of got a sense, especially at that end with, in, in a way, it was kind of for me, Karabai took a little bit of a fall from grace where he says, you know, I have, this is the cause, Lynn, what's your cause? Like he had wrapped everything up, you know, with, within that. But it's as if, and you mentioned the sense of he's in a huge river, like he, he feels himself a participant in history and that he has a role to play. And he, through these actions, he can change the world. And mm-hmm. that to me, as soon as he pr- professes that, it's kind of like, chunk some put a little chink in his armor his self-assessment his own casting himself in that role you know as this kind of a product of this great history um uh struck me and i think that's took me to a, a point where i found myself um now trying to to replay it all from the you know british raj and afghanistan and lynn's piece i mean it just the immensity of the scope um, uh, took me to a place where I was really challenged to to really deeply process it again mm. until some of the scenes in the next chapter. Mm. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's where. I, well, I, 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 you're, I, you definitely highlight a couple of things, like his his sensitivity to human nature, and it's it's what's really amazing is that it's also combined with this historical sensibility and this mind for. Uh, for correspondences and for patterns and for uh, the, for sensing this, the way that time spirals or cycles upon itself. So he sees the connections between uh, his mentor and the um, Uncle Bob's, uh, one of the, uh, the Raj's, uh, some, some, some colonial uh, administrator, some colonial governor in Afghanistan uh, from the British Empire in the uh, 1800s. Uh, and how like there's ancestry there as well, right? So he, his own um, grand, you know, his, his own ancestors were uh, rulers, leaders, uh, and and they interacted with the the leaders from uh, other nations, uh, and uh, and the, so history repeats itself, and he sees that, and he, I think, as you put, point out well. It's not his personal ego that is a part of the, um, although there is pride. But we come back to we'll come back to that. But it's that this entire history is playing itself out, and you know, Lynn doesn't talk so much about the. Um, he talks about the philosophical and the spiritual and the sort of mystical aspects of of Cotter's thought, but not so much about the religious and the specifically like Islamic uh, nature of the of those thoughts. Um, and I, I, I'm, uh, I mean, you, you uh, say that Cotter takes a fall when he places himself in, cert, in the position of fulfilling this, um, this kind of grand, this grand mission, this cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I wonder if, I mean, if, if, well, I, want, I guess I wonder how to think about um, the specifically religious aspect of that, because Cotter has a, this cosmology, it's sort of trans interfaith, you know, it's, it's uh, probably a little bit process philosophy and uh, omega point theory and things like that. But he's also a Muslim, right? And he's also deeply connected, you know, with his culture, uh, with his family, with his with a tradition, you know, with a history. Uh, and 
I, I, I just, I, I don't know exactly how to think about how those different streams in, interact because they're both so uh, operative. I mean, they're, they're both so influential and important uh, in, in the book. And yeah, I, 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 I I'm, um, well, um, let me, let, what do you think uh, of that? I mean, I, I want there's, there's something I want to get to, but I'm, it's not, it's just kind of on the tip of my mind. I haven't, it's not quite clear yet. It's sort of like fuzzing into existence. And, oh, and out. Do you think you can talk yourself into it? Cause I'm listening. It sounds um, like it's right there. Well, um, there was the point about the blind singers again, like noticing the uh, the correspondences and the, the the you know the way the time circles back. He the, it, this mission is occurring in the same month as uh, a, a previous um, uh, battle uh, when involving the, the British uh, and uh, Afghani's at, at that time, um, but. The question that that I had is 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 the um, let me take a breath and, and really try to see it clearly. Uh, does he fulfill his cause? And is it is it the parts that are that are egoic? We might say that are. Um, like the, the sort of personal excess to that cause, like the, the horses, for example, are, are, are those like, like once he fulfills the cause, which he's done now, like he's brought all these supplies to the fighters uh, and, and all that's left is his pride. Now all that's left is to deliver those horses. Uh, is that like the, the kind of moment or the trigger for his final demise? Right. Maybe that's what I'm sort of noticing or trying trying to get at. Um, and like his chink, uh, I don't I, see, I don't know if it's I actually I'm I, I don't know if it's his um, his his dedication to the cause itself or the kind of like extra layer that that is the pride before the fall or that like tragic flaw that would um you know, lead him to take risks that were not really warranted uh, by the situation itself. Yeah, I think in, I'm, you know, as I'm relating that um, for me, the fall, and I'm not sure it's what the author or what Lynn necessarily would have said, but for me, when he says, you know, we're going to change the world, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, just that, that one little step into what maybe the hubris, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so in my mind, there's something about like his beautiful philosophy, his, his, you know, holiness, his vision, <laughs> something like there was a, you know, that casting of himself in the, in that role. <clears throat> and then I also want to bring in is, um, Lynn, I think uh, if you don't mind, I'll just read this sentence. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it says, uh, so they've had their confrontation and Cotterby is turning away and leaving and Lynn is staying. And uh, uh, it says, but his golden eyes gleam through the gray white mist and the old love was in them still. Hmm. Cotterby's old love for him. And not until we were having our conversation, did I think about, Oh, this was a moment for Cotterby as well. His son, right. Has hmm. basically said, I reject you and all that you stand for, and you're not doing good. You're putting hate in people. Mm. And so at this moment, you know, is this, is this, is this a moment where his, you know, his son, you know, supposedly not his real son, but Lynn, that rejection, is that a part of the fall? Is that an ingredient, right? That leads to the demise. And I'm thinking of this somewhat symbolically, obviously he didn't set up, you know, the, the, the subsequent yeah. situation, but for Cotterby, here's Lynn saying, fuck you and all you stand for. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's such a classic moment. Uh, and it's reminding me actually that a Cotter, Cotter himself was kind of a fuck up with respect to his father. Right. Uh, he, 
uh, was sent away at age 10 because he wasn't showing signs that he could live up to uh, the, the role like designated for him as a, as a, as a tribal leader. And so that's why he was sent to uh, Kassam or Katam to study with uh, his, his mentor. Uh, I don't want to say his to, name. To live with his uncle who then, yeah. In a oh, go- you're right. That's right. Um, and, and then what does he do? Uh, after that time, he brings a blood feud upon the family that causes both of his brothers to be killed and both of his father's brothers, his uncles, uh, to be killed, as well as you know other other back and forth. So, uh, I mean, his father doesn't disown him uh, for this, um, but in order to end it, he he voluntarily, I guess, leaves and he promises to his mother that he will never return, and that's like a sacred oath. Uh, so he's in returning. He's uh, he's he's a, he's actually violating that oath to his mother, uh, and I mean he's he's also in some way like kind of bringing back or reactivating the like the um, the, the feud because like the feud having ended is predicated upon his removal. His not being there. I think they may have even supposedly thought he was dead or he wanted them to believe he was dead. That's right. Uh, so like at his very heart, there's, the, and I don't know who knows why he didn't. I mean, if, if only he had been a lot more loved as a child or something like that, it's one of those situations, you know, instead of expected to be something that he was not, I mean, maybe his, his real destiny was to be a brilliant scholar or philosopher or something like that, or a poet or, yeah. Uh, he clearly had those talents, right? Uh, but because, um, because you know, he couldn't live up to the masculine ideal of the tri- tribal chief, and uh, he uh, was sent away and sent on this, this dark path that um, ended up consuming his life in uh, not just in uh, the ca- a cause which may or may not be righteous uh, religiously and politically, you know, but also in this, this self-cause. Uh, this cause to redeem himself, prove himself, uh, uh, restore some sort of primal um, uh, excess, you know, be a sense of being loved, sense of being uh, destined. He, he had even, if you actually now that I'm remembering as well, when he was born, there was a Sufi uh, teacher who had come through and uh, and claimed that this child was destined to be a great leader. Uh, and it was partially correct, <laughs> but but in this kind of perverse way, where you know, not 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 in the sense that his father had, would have, I think, expected. Uh, so, and there's another little piece I'm just remembering now that in a more peaceful moment, um, Kader by, and it's like I want to say Khan, right? The Khan, mm-hmm. the leader Kader by Khan is talking about or asking Lin after his own father. And Lin says, well, you're the closest thing to a father that I've ever had. And Kadaba says, don't say that. Mm, that's right. I, don't say that. Never say that. And then right. that propels, I believe, a big piece of the story. I think that may have triggered some, some whole big piece of that story. So I don't know. It makes me wonder if later on we're going to find more about Lin's relationship because he's, doesn't, he's, he's basically said, you know, I didn't really have a father. That father, that figure was missing in some way. Hmm. Wow. Uh, I guess um, maybe we could wrap up. Yeah. Um, the last things that Lynn says in that chapter is, is that he loved him. And, uh, even, you know, even though moments before he's telling him how that he hates him more than, more than anything. Uh, and he knows that it's over. Uh, and, um, and this is before the, you know, the events of the, <laughs> of the next chapter. Um, but how like in, in, in eradicable that love is and that need, to love is, uh, I mean, 
in through all this, it's it's still there. Yeah, I remember thinking that from the very very beginning. That question of after we've been through all that we've been through, do we still choose love? Can we love the world? And then by extension, its contents and the description of love as a one way street coming from us. And uh, I thought that was a really beautiful, beautiful, deep, powerful description in that moment at the end of that chapter. And he even says it twice. I think, let me look, I prayed my heartbreak into him and I loved him. I loved him. Oh yeah. That was so, so powerful. Mm. All right. That was, uh, thank you. Thank you. That was a good conversation. I thought I felt like I feel good about that. Like, well, at the beginning of this, where I was kind of talking about different approaches and how I you know, think about this, like I'm, I'm trying to get, this is weird, but I'm trying to get good at it. Like I'm trying to like to um, just have better conversations and uh, I'm learning. I feel like I'm learning a lot in these past few weeks. I have talking with you, David, Pam, um, and you know the others who have who've joined uh, various times, and then other book I'm reading, and uh, it's just like just really cool how like how we can kind of think together and like put the pieces of pieces together, and and it can sort of like we can spark things in in one another and. Um, like I actually leave a conversation like this feeling like I have a better understanding or like I just, I'm more integrated in some way. Like I'm a little more balanced in some way. I remember things that are really important in the magic of the moment of relating like mm -hmm. the piece about, Oh, that's right. That conversation about the father, where I suddenly put things together in a different way through the um, mutuality of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it does, it shifts my appreciation and understanding and the effect the book's having. So it is magical in this way. Yeah. That's cool. Well, Thank I, you. I, it's just great to have uh, a partner like you and, uh, and Pam and every, everyone who's participated. Like it's mm -hmm. just been cool. Like that, that we put our hearts into it. I think I feel like we are doing that and, uh, and it's bearing some fruit. Uh, so um, let's, uh, let's continue. Probably All right. I look forward to next week. To go. Yeah. And I'm starting already to get curious about the next book. <laughs> so um, that's a, that's either a good sign or a bad sign. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I have it with, I have it. I, you know, so hopefully we'll get into it together. All right, cool. Well, have a good night. You too. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay,